praying God, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, gathers, cares for, protects the church. We are gathered in the name of this praying God. I want to invite you to join us in prayer as we open ourselves to God's voice this morning. Lord, as we gather at a distance this morning, our prayer is that you will speak to each of us wherever we are, that we will hear your voice through the words that we read, through the thoughts that come up, that we would allow our bodies to follow your way as we move from this place. And so our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. I read to us from chapter 5, from verse 21 until verse 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him into the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came to and fell at his feet, and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion, with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. I wonder how our grandchildren will name this time. Newspaper columnists write about the year that shall not be named, 2020. We joke about needing a do-over of 2020 in 2021. It's all called pretending that what was, was not. Obviously, that will not be what our grandchildren name this year. Perhaps some other disaster will make 2020 pale in comparison, but by the look of things, 2020 will be remembered far more than most years. It will stand out like the years of big wars, dramatic social change. 2020 will definitely be named and remembered. But let us not pretend that all is well. 2020 and by all accounts 2021 will be an extension of this time, was an immense interruption in our lives. And Mark 5 is in many ways a reflection on interruption. It is a story of interruption. And rather than try and forget what interrupts, I want to invite our interruptions into our reflection this morning. Note them, name them, think on them, pray through them. Mark 5 reaches across centuries to us today, touching so many nerves. The physical touching. We used to be a society with lots of physical interaction. By necessity, we keep our distance now. The shame of illness. Let's not forget that there continue to be instances where admitting that we are positive with this new virus is also a shame. The joy of healing. Some things are timeless. It is the woman interrupting Jesus to whom I want to draw our attention this morning. 
not only interrupting Jesus, perhaps not even primarily interrupting Jesus, perhaps not interrupting Jesus at all, but interrupting the crowd, interrupting the leader from the synagogue, interrupting us. Ten months ago, there was some easy talk about how COVID acts as some great equalizer, indiscriminately infecting both rich and poor. There was some easy talk about how with COVID, we are all in the same boat together. But even if we held to the idea for those first 21 days of lockdown, countdown, and in fact, the cracks in such an idea were showing even before it was uttered. But even if we held to it, the months of devastation that followed called it out for the lie it was. We are in this together in the same way that those on a lifeboat and those drowning in the sea may be together in the sinking of a ship. Yes, they are part of the same tragedy, but there is little comparison in how their lives are affected. But let's not be hasty in deciding who is on the lifeboat and who is busy drowning. Faced with the right set of comorbidities, COVID presents itself as a literal threat of death to some, while the young and healthy might feel themselves invincible. Obviously, the danger of this idea is repeatedly shown when young and healthy people succumb to this, yet we should not forget the immense fear that this virus holds for some in our society. For some, employment meant learning new skills, adapting new rhythms, at home, learning what Zoom fatigue means. For others, it meant the devastation of a job loss, the immense risk of having to travel and work at risk of infection, the reality of young people already facing bad odds at finding an entry into a job market, now having a slow down economy and limitations in travel added to this. For some of us, this will be remembered as a time of frustration, for others as a time when relationships were permanently disrupted through death. Mark 5 has two stories of healing. The narrative is framed by the account of Jairus' daughter and interrupted by the account of an unnamed woman. They could not be more opposite, male and female. In ancient Jewish culture, a strict division of roles was held, usually held to, with men acting in public, women in private. But here, Jairus would be taken into a private room for the healing of his daughter, and the unnamed woman will be healed in the middle of a crowd. Jairus is the leader in the synagogue. A religious man, in Jewish culture of the day, he would have been considered pure, keeping by a myriad of rules and regulations. The unnamed woman is impure per definition, due to the ongoing bleeding. For many, contact with her would have been something they would try to avoid at all cost. Jairus is probably at least moderately well off, possibly even rich. At his house, a crowd is gathering, possibly at least some of whom were professional mourners. The woman is poor. At least in part because she spent all she had on doctors, but probably her condition would have made it near impossible for her to have any sustained income to, to begin with. Jairus is told to keep the healing quiet. The woman is called onto a platform and God's grace is, pre is presented to all. For all these differences, or perhaps because of them, the unnamed woman interrupts Jesus, Jairus, the disciples, the crowd. And in a way, Jesus facilitates the interruption. Jesus forces the interruption to interrupt the whole procession. He forces the procession, which hopes for a miracle of healing of the daughter of an important religious leader, to be interrupted with a healing they probably did not really want to speak of. What could have been headline news? Daughter of well-known local leader miraculously healed becomes awkward account. Famous healer fraternizes with unclean woman. I fear that we have become so caught up in our own interruption, that we may be numb to the interruptions that God wants to draw our attention to. Let's not downplay Jairus' pain. Every parent know that there is little worse than having your child deathly ill. What is worse is having your child die. There is little that interrupts life so completely for a parent as the sickness of a child, except for the death of a child, which disrupts life completely. Viewed through this lens, the interruption of the healing of a daughter near death in order to focus attention on a woman ill for a dozen years past seem insensitive to the extreme. However, we too live in a world where some lives matter far more than others, where the death of some result in global trauma and the death of others is met with global silence. The insensitivity of the interruption or forcing the procession to note the interruption serves to reveal a deeper problem of ancient Galilee and modern South Africa. We prefer not to be interrupted with the trauma of some lives or the ga gathering in crowds for others. And therefore we need to zoom in. Note the interruption of Jairus' interruption. Note Jesus drawing attention to the interruption, forcing the crowd to take note. 
feel the discomfort with one miracle by a procession seeking the thrill of another, because this was not where I wanted to see a miracle. But this is not merely about noting a moment in an ancient text, but rather about being drawn to where that moment is recurring in our lives. And this time where the distinction between social distancing and social distancing between a health protocol and a breakdown in community can so easily become blurred, we need to sensitize ourselves to the interruption to which God wants to draw our attention. The interruption to our interrupted lives. The other healings within our focus drive towards seeking health in one publicly visible quest. Let us turn once more to the woman who dares to touch Jesus. And yes, note the disciples' consternation. Everyone is touching Jesus, yet he asks who touched him. Because there is touching and touching. A crowd pressing in around him, but a woman reaching out in faith. A woman who tells the whole truth. We can easily read this truth as a mere confession like in a court of law, confessing that indeed it was she who touched. But no, the truth she shares is clearly deeper, because Jesus responds to a faith story. She not only confesses to touching, but reveals the meaning behind her touching. It's a confession of faith, a search, a conviction. Indeed, she is witnessing. The poor woman, who should not be in a crowd and definitely not speak in public, right in the center of the story, as the light shone on her as she becomes a witness to faith. So in the middle of one big interruption, with most of us experiencing days as a series of small interruptions that must be avoided, how do we note the interruption that God draws our attention to? The reality is that it does not come with an announcement by trumpet, but quite often with a shy reaching out, a touch, a word, a hesitant call for attention, in the hustle and bustle of life easily missed since everyone is touching, calling for our attention. It takes an act of discernment to note the interruption of interruptions. What if we lived our lives with the suspicion that somewhere this week there will be a moment where God is wanting to note an interruption, to stop, to attend, to listen to a child or a friend, to a stranger or a colleague, but most probably to someone who we might feel is slightly out of place where we are, because being interrupted is perhaps part of following the way of Christ in this world. May the interruption that we are living through make us more sensitive to the interruptions that God wants us to focus our attention on and not cause us to close our eyes to the woman who interrupts a miracle. Let us pray. Lord, we live at a time of immense pain. Many of us have lost friends, colleagues, family that were dear to us in the past weeks and months. We see the pain and suffering around us. And we are constantly at the risk of being numb, of not hearing this pain. Our prayer this morning is that you would open us so that we allow ourselves to be interrupted in those places where you are calling us to. We allow our lives to be interrupted by others so that we can hear where they are, so that we can be your presence in their lives, where you send us. Lord, we pray for a world and a country that are facing immensely difficult times. We pray for our leaders that have to make difficult choices and require immense wisdom on all levels, internationally, nationally, our local leaders, our leaders of churches, and business, communities. Lord, we pray for your church that need to reimagine who we will be within this crisis and on the other side of it. Let us hear your voice. Let us walk your footsteps so that we can be faithful witnesses and a holy presence in this world that needs it so urgently. Amen.